So I've been asked to talk about the army and Interfet, and I'm conscious that I'm sitting here in front of a lot of people that really uh, know the issue at least as well as I do. Uh, but as somebody who was a rifle company commander and then a reconnaissance guy uh, in East Seymour, uh, I've got a very specific view of what happened during the operation. In this session, what I want to do is step back a little bit and talk about what it meant for the Army after East Timor, what the impacts were on, in particular, capability and concepts. You know, this is how we like to remember Interfet, the idea of uh, helpful, compassionate Australians dealing with the peace-loving people of East Timor and bringing a degree of healing and safety after uh, an incredibly traumatic time. It's not how everybody in the army, anyway, remembers the operation. This is a quote from a, a colonel of engineers who later on commanded our reconstruction task force in Afghanistan, who had quite a negative view of how the operation went down, uh, that we were a sad and badly prepared joke, um, that our core failure was logistic support, but it was compounded by lack of communications equipment, virtually no military police, also not a comment you particularly often hear from uh, army officers, um, and extremely lax control and discipline uh, in headquarters at every level. Uh, he went on to say it was a wake up call and we were extremely lucky that we didn't face a serious opposition that Taliban or Iraqi insurgents would have carved this up. I want to suggest that the truth is somewhere in between. It's not the propaganda image of the compassionate and peace-loving Australian digger uh, helping a local Timorese kid, although of course that did happen. It's also not this very dark view of an organisation that was out of its depth. I do think we struggled. I think we were operating right on the edge of our ability to cope, but we were extraordinarily lucky, extraordinarily lucky in the talent, the initiative, and the leadership of people at every level, and we were able to pull, uh, pull through. And I think the most important takeaway, for me anyway, from East Timor, was um, in the last sentence there, that it was a wake-up call. And that's how I like to think about it, a very timely, wake-up call for what was to come later. So what I want to talk about is the key conditions that existed during the operation. Anytime we talk about an operation and the lessons learned from it, it's extraordinarily important that we go back and remember what were the conditions under which those lessons were observed. Otherwise, we risk misapplying uh, lessons from one type of operation to a different kind. So we're going to talk about that. I'm then going to talk a little bit about the principal impacts of the operation on the Army, uh, and in particular on capability development that came later. Um, and then, as I said, I think the main outcome of the operation was as a wake-up call that put us in an extraordinarily good position for the kinds of things we had to do uh, after 9-11. So these are the conditions as, as I think they existed during the operation. Um, and again, if you are looking at lessons from East Timor and you do not have a significant number of these conditions in place, you shouldn't be applying those lessons, right? Because it's not a comparable uh, set of circumstances. But in the case of East Timor, the first, and I think most important, was that we had an extraordinarily experienced uh, senior national security team. National Security Committee, Committee of Cabinet, uh, SCONS, the relevant uh, diplomatic and intelligence personnel, it, for none of them was it, as we say in America, their first rodeo, right? They'd been through a number of incidents before, particularly in May 1998, with the collapse of the regime uh, of General Suharto in Indonesia, but also uh, the MV Tampa incident in the, in, uh, sorry, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the intervention in uh, Bougainville, uh, and a variety of other things that happened in the late 1990s had set the uh, National Security Committee in particular in uh, a way of understanding the environment with an experience of how the uh, mechanics of government were going to work. 
And then, of course, during the operation in East Timor, while we were still deployed, we had the MV Tampa incident, as I mentioned, and then later on, 9-11. Uh, so by the time we got to uh, the second phase of op operations in East Timor around 2006, we we're already dealing with a set of circumstances that all the key decision makers understood. Second key uh, condition was an interdepartmental reluctance to plan. And maybe this is a infantry major's point of view, but from my standpoint, it seemed very much as if during the lead up to East Timor, DFAT in particular, were extraordinarily reluctant to countenance deep operational planning on the part of defence, primarily because of a fear, which I think turned out to be well justified, that if you let the army start planning for things, people will say, well, we're the army, we fight wars, we've just been given this problem, therefore it must be a war. Um, and you would end up with a much more aggressive approach to a problem and perhaps create the problem that you were trying to avoid during the planning process. Uh, and of course, when we did get the problem very late in the day, we did indeed move into quite a war uh, footing. I was on the seventh plane in on the first morning, 20th of uh, September, uh, 1999, into Comoro Airfield in Dili with the mission verb, capture. And I said to my CO going in, you sure captures the right mission verb? Aren't we securing from a force where we already have Australians on the ground? And he said to me, harden up, basically, um, and get in there ready to, to open fire. So I think it was justified, uh, thinking that we might take the, the bit too firmly between our teeth. But I think one of the key lessons that came later was how to deal with that um, quite understandable difference of perspective between diplomats and military planners. Third, we had strong bipartisan public support. And that's, as we know, uh, rather rare um, for a variety of historical reasons, both on the right and on the left in Australian politics, there was strong support for uh, the intervention as it did in fact take place. And uh, of all the things which I'd say uh, are unusual about the East Timor operation, that was probably the most unusual. Fourth, we were operating at scale for almost the first time after a very long peace. Uh, General Hurley taking one RAR to Somalia in 1993 was probably the closest we'd come uh, to anything like this in the preceding 25 years, but even that was just a battalion group. Uh, and I can remember walking around Dili on a rare visit to the headquarters about halfway through Interfet and starting to recognise basically everybody that I knew in the army being in East Timor and thinking, this is probably not good. Like, who's left back home? Uh, we were operating at uh, a very large scale. We were the framework nation. Of the, of the multinational force, um, or the lead nation, as we sometimes say. I'll put an asterisk next to that because, um, as we've mentioned, we got some extraordinarily valuable support from the United States uh, and from others. But one of the key things about this operation, which we haven't seen since, is that all the other, compartment, all the other uh, components of the uh, coalition were able to blame us for everything that went wrong in the same way that we like to blame the Americans for everything that goes wrong in Afghanistan and Iraq or before that in Vietnam. Turns out when you're the framework nation, uh, it's all too easy to throw stones when you're not in charge, but when you're in charge of everything, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a whole different environment. It was reasonably close to home. Uh, you know, Dili's about 700 kilometres from Darwin as the crow flies, a lot further by sea. Uh, it's extraordinarily complex coastal hydro hydrography, uh, extraordinarily com complex weather patterns, but it's not that far away. Um, and we were operating within the envelope of uh, what we would now call a military operation in littoral environment, a coastal uh, air, land and sea environment that was reasonably close uh, to home. Uh, as I said, it was urban, um, sorry, it was, it was littoral, it was coastal. It was also mostly urban. I personally think that if you, if you break down the sequence of the East Timor operation uh, during its interfet phase, the decisive periods of uh, the operation all took place between the 20th of September when we landed and the 16th of October, which was the Battle of Ida Basilala. Um, 
And in that period of about three and a half weeks, that's when we set the conditions that allowed success for the rest of the operation. It wasn't all done by then. We still, it wasn't just a matter of time. We still had a lot of work to do and a lot of things to ensure that went right. But the success of the operation was reasonably assured after that first uh, roughly three and a half weeks. And all of that combat happened in a coastal environment. Most of it happened in built up areas. Uh, and it happened against an irregular and a hybrid enemy. By irregular, I mean a non-state, a set of non-state actors, that is the militia. But if you think back also, East Timor was one of our first engagements with something that's become rather fashionable lately, the idea of hybrid warfare, where you've got a state actor sponsoring and enabling a non-state adversary. And we very much dealt with that uh, in uh, East Timor. And for all the public diplomacy, uh, we were regularly encountering uh, regular TNI, uh, Capacitor troops and others supporting and sponsoring uh, the militia during our time in the field uh, in East Timor. That said, the enemy had extraordinarily limited capability. Uh, and looking back from you know, deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan, no IEDs, no drones, no significant terrorist component directed against us, although very much directed uh, against the population. Uh, it makes that initial comment that I uh, put up uh, ring true in that the enemy that we dealt with in East Timor really lacked a lot of the sorts of capabilities that we unfortunately have become used to dealing with since. So again, some of the lessons from East Timor aren't going to translate to an environment where, you know, an enemy has uh, armed drones or remotely operated sniper weapons or the ability to uh, take out an Abrams tank with an IED, which is the environment that we find ourselves in uh, in much of the world now. Two final points um, in terms of conditions. There was no significant threat to Australian territory. There was, of course, threats to our platforms at sea and, uh, and on the ground. There was a threat to our personnel deployed but we weren't at risk of a strike inside Australia against the Australian homeland. And in more recent conflicts, we of course have been uh, at risk of that. And then finally, there were no other large scale commitments going on at the time. Um, Bougainville uh, was still running, but other than that, we didn't have multiple simultaneous large scale deployments to worry about. So we were at some level the only major game in town and we benefited from having that uh, very close attention from the top level down. So having talked about those conditions, let me just bring out quickly some of the key lessons. Um, first one was the need for scale. We were very good, we were not big enough. Repeatedly we found that we just didn't have the capacity, as distinct from the capability, that we needed to do what had to be done. We made it work, but as I said earlier, it was a near run thing. Second key, les key uh, lesson was the need for a capability to do joint forcible entry from both air and sea. So we came in from the air and the sea within less than 24 hours on the north coast in Dili. Within a couple of weeks, we were landing on the south coast in an amphibious uh, operation. And in between, we'd done multiple air mobile uh, and other deployments across the entire territory. And the ability of the force to be mobile, to cover a very large amount of ground in a short period of time was extraordinarily important to our ability to shut down what could have been uh, a much more dangerous uh, enemy threat. Maneuver operations in the littoral environment became one of the key army concepts within a couple of years of East Timor. And that's no accident because we recognised that we were operating in an environment where the operational effects of land, air and sea all overlap. And Army's support for the Navy during the uh, hearings on the maritime strategy a number of years after East Timor is also no accident because the Army realised that you might have the best light infantry or the best cavalry forces or the best uh, special operations troops in the world. It doesn't really matter if you can't get where you need to be. And we realised that we would be operating in a regional environment that was overwhelmingly uh, littoral, coastal. Urban operations didn't get much discussion at the time of the operation. But again, if we look back, we can see that it was the ability to shut down the militia 
in the major cities very rapidly and quickly pushed them away from the bulk of the East Timorese population that allowed us to shut down uh, the, uh, the violence that had been going on and which was the reason for the, the deployment in the first place. Um, my little uh, border unpleasantness, which you very kindly referred to, Tom, uh, at Motain on the 10th of October, or the SAS uh, fight at Ida Basalala, or some of the ambushes that happened later in the operation, in many ways were the adversary trying to break back in to an environment that we'd already successfully excluded them from. And that was, um, I think, um, a genius move on the part of the force commander to ensure that we set the conditions early to uh, enable the operation to play out as we wanted it to play out. And that was all about dominating the urban space. We learned very quickly that we needed better protected mobility uh, and better communications. And again, the hardened and networked army concept that came out several years after uh, East Timor drew a lot from the experience of our Third Fourth Cavalry uh, Squadron and our own um, various, uh, I was going to say stolen, but let's just say acquired uh, UN vehicles that we had on the ground uh, in, in, uh, in Dili and elsewhere, in trying to pull together some form of uh, tactical mobility that could work in that environment. And we, again, it was a near run thing. Um, we've already heard from the Navy, I think, I, I don't have much to add on the issue of expeditionary logistics and sustainment. I think it was, in fact, one of the critical concerns uh, I'll say that I and my troops had our first hot meal, hot, rash, hot combat ration meal, on day 11 of the operation, and our first fresh meal on day 56. Um, that's not an ideal way to plan an operation, it's not how we planned it. Uh, I was very proud of my diggers' ability to cope under that uh, set of circumstances, but one of our key lessons from the operation was, let's not do that again. Uh, and I think we have ver been very successful in operations since in applying that lesson. And then finally, um, I can neither confirm nor deny that a, a certain uh, SAS officer threw a punch at a, uh, an RAR battalion commander during the operation, but there were times at which uh, the relationship between special operations and general purpose forces became quite strained during the operation. Part of that was to do with command and control and the way we were running operations boxes uh, within our AORs. A lot of it, frankly, I think was personality based. But one of the key lessons that we drew from the operation was the need for better uh, integration between special and general purpose forces. And anyone that served in Afghanistan uh, in the last five or six years has benefited from lessons from East Timor that really shaped the way that we operated um, with the SOTG in Afghanistan and its, its cooperation with uh, the Reconstruction Task Force. So those are key lessons. I've talked about littoral and amphibious operations. This is a landing in Suai. This is the image that gets most play. Uh, but in fact, I think, when I think of these operations, I think about uh, the ships arriving about 24 hours into the operation where we had seized Comoro advanced through the city on foot to secure the harbour and then had the ships coming in uh, with it, our own infantry uh, holding the, uh, the port area for them to come in. And the degree of coordination and individual initiative and teamwork that was needed to pull that off uh, was uh, quite um, impressive uh, to me anyway. Air mobile operations, this is uh, one section from uh, my company uh, about to board for the air mobile operation to uh, to Balibo uh, in uh, the, about day 10 of the operation, uh, day five of the operation. Um, we had been used to operating combat operations using air mobile forces. We had not been used to doing it at scale. Uh, and doing it at this scale took a significant amount of planning and a significant amount of uh, logistic support, which until we did the operation, wasn't really clear that we'd be, we would be able to pull it off. I'll also mention, and I, I hate saying this because he's here and I don't want to come off as a, as a suck up, but the, uh, the, let's call it the tactical genius of jumping an entire battalion right to the border with 10,000 
TNI and militia between us and the rest of the force. Um, seems like a pretty bold gamble in retrospect. It seemed pretty near suicidal at the time, um, but it worked out because what we did was to effectively offset their planning and their thinking about how they were going to run their operation. And for the rest of the, comp the campaign, they were reacting to us. Um, and it was uh, a few hard swallows going in at the beginning of that operation, but it certainly paid off uh, in our ability to wrong foot uh, the adversary. Urban operations in coastal cities I've already talked about a little bit. The operation was a lot more urban than the media portrayal at the time tends to suggest and many of the decisive events happened uh, during that period. I want to point out one very important thing again uh, about the operation and that was our ability to shut down a potential insurgency right from the outset. And we only know that this was a, a, an ex extremely important uh, move because we didn't do that, or the, the coalition didn't do that in East Timor, in, uh, in Iraq, and we've seen the consequences since. One of the things I was most impressed by at the time was the decision made at force headquarters to take what you might call a behavioral rather than a political approach to rules of engagement. Uh, and to not say we're here to support independence or we're here to support the autonomy vote, to instead say, we don't care about your politics. We're not here to take a side in terms of your decision that you just voted for. What we're here to do is to stop the violence. And if you pick up a weapon, you will be disarmed. And if you attempt to use that weapon against somebody else, we reserve the right to shoot you. Uh, and applying that very impartial, behaviorally based approach successfully shut down the violence within a couple of weeks. And I think it was incredibly important. We didn't just disarm the, uh, the militia. We worked with CNRT to make sure there were not Fallentil or CNRT people walking around with weapons. Uh, we had uh, a, once a, a, a single impartial point of view that allowed everybody to feel safe. And that turned out to be incredibly important in the way that the operation went down. And anyone who spent any time in Iraq knows what can go very badly wrong if you fail to do that in just the first 24 or 48 hours after seizing a major city. Because in the case of Baghdad, we never did that and we've been living with some of the consequences ever since. Final couple of points is uh, this idea of uh, integrated effect. It's a bit hard to see on the, uh, the slide there, but you've got a, a LAV, an infantry patrol, a PSYOP team, uh, and a bunch of media all walking down the street uh, in East Timor. And the, uh, a lot of the lessons about how to run the operation that were most important came out of that experience of generating uh, integrated uh, media effect. My last like two minutes before Tom gives me the hook. Um, protected mobility and communications. We realized that M113s, while venerable and um, let's say not particularly pleasurable to ride around in, uh, weren't necessarily the way to go for future operations. They got us there in East Timor. If the enemy had had IEDs or RPGs or any significant armor of their own after the first few days, it would have been a completely different story. We learned that lesson and the hardened and networked army ca capability that came out of that was a response to our lessons in East Timor. So my summary of it is that it was a timely wake up call. We made it work. We always could have done better, could have done a hell of a lot worse. Um, and I think that the army took those lessons, hardened a networked army, um, maneuver operations in the littoral environment, a thing called complex war fighting. We thought about irregular uh, and hybrid warfare uh, and, and put that to heart. My final point, uh, and I'm not going to go through those all again. Uh, my final point uh, whoops, is going to be that we need to be humble about uh, our understanding of, of operations. I was a dedicated hater of the Bush Ranger project and the Bushmaster vehicle that came out of it. When I was in the Army headquarters after uh, East Timor, I was uh, quite boring on the subject of how we'd acquired that vehicle for no good reason under a different set of strategic circumstances. Now we found ourselves after 9-11 doing expeditionary operations and it just didn't make any sense. And I've got to tell you, I was completely wrong about that. We've lost 31 of those vehicles completely destroyed in Afghanistan since we acquired them. We've never had a single person killed 
in some circumstances, virtually everybody in every vehicle that's been destroyed has walked away. So it was a genius acquisition. And if I'd been in charge of that acquisition process, I would have killed it. Uh, and we probably would have had people running around in M113s getting killed in Afghanistan. So anything I've said here, you know, it's a personal perspective based on the uh, experience since this team, but we've got to be extraordinarily humble about our ability to predict, because we do get things wrong almost as often as we get them right. With that, I will shut up, Tom. Mm -hmm. so. so one question for you, who and what have we learned from our operating partners in East Timor? So I think um, I, would, I would point to two things. Um, one is the, what we learned from the Timorese partner. Um, and you know, we often don't realise that one of the critical operational partners that we had during the operation was the Timorese people themselves. Um, I was one of two officers in 3 Brigade that spoke any Indonesian. Uh, we had two people in the brigade that spoke Tedum, uh, and we just didn't have the level of operational language capability or local cultural understanding that we needed to do the operation. So that was how many in the brigade that spoke Tedum? Uh, two, to my knowledge. Yeah. Um, now, that was partly an effect of the, of the rapid deployment process, but the key lesson from that is um, you, know, you can take every second officer in the brigade and give them whatever operational uh, language training you want them to have, but uh, at the end of the day, nothing can compensate for having a partner on the ground that knows the environment and uh, speaks the language and can work the cultural piece. And our relations with the Catholic Church in East Timor, with CNRT, with the local um, uh, public safety councils that formed in different areas were, were critically important. And I, I like to think we've applied that in, um, uh, in uh, Afghanistan in particular. The other partner, of course, is the United States. Uh, and I, I couldn't agree more. There's a lot to learn from the Americans. Uh, there's also some things that you might best ca characterise as negative lessons. Um, and the, the, in particular, the idea that you don't always have to kill somebody in order to um, make, make your point and uh, generate the operational uh, outcome that you're looking for. Sometimes you do, right? I mean, counterinsurgency is not peacekeeping. It's a form of warfare. And if you're not killing a substantial number of people, some level you're probably doing it wrong, right? But uh, the way that we've learned to do it, I think it, it partly draws on watching them struggle in that role of uh, framework nation. Yeah. Please join with me in thank you.